So the, uh, the title of my sermon is called The Compassion of the Christ. So it's not an, all exclu- an exhaustive list, but today I'm going to show some of the ways that the Lord has shown compassion on us. You know, He is a God of compassion and mercy and long-suffering and loving kindness. You know, so we should show the kindness and compassion to our brothers especially, but also to strangers. Um, and I do want to say this, sir, that not all who, who say they're Christian are your brothers. You know, so those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're, they're your brothers. You know, so to be a brother, they must be a child of God because you also are a child of God. Um, and your brethren are those who believe that salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and by faith alone. If they have another spirit, another Jesus or another gospel, then they are false brethren. You know, and we're warned against them by the Apostle Paul. You know, and they are not children of God, and they're not your brethren. So in John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So these are not fleshly brothers. These are brothers in the spirit. This is the new man that's born of God. And in 1 John 3, 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth not us, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth yet doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we're also brothers of Christ. You know, we're fellow heirs with, with Christ, and we're his brother, because he wanted to be the first among many brethren. You know, and we're also brethren to each other as well. Um, and I'll just read the dictionary definition of compassion. It's a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. And some synonyms can be uh, pity, sympathy, empathy, understanding, care, concern, tenderheartedness, soft-heartedness, warm-heartedness, warmth, love, brotherly love, tenderness, gentleness, mercy, feeling, consideration, kindness, kind-heartedness, and charity. You know, and these are the, attribute, the attributes that we should have, uh, especially for our brethren, because we see the Lord have these same attributes toward us, you know, um, and we should obviously to be more like Christ, you know, we should, we should uh, use his example that he left for us. You know, so when Christ came down, he came down as a man with the same temptations and infirmities that we have. Hebrews 4.14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And as uh, Brother Kevin was reading through Hebrews 5, I said, verse 2, it says, Who can have compassion on the ignorant? and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. You know, so God came down to feel what we feel, to, to understand what it's like to be us, to be human, you know, to just understand what it's like to live on this earth. So he understands when we go through infirmities, and that's why we can boldly go into the throne room of grace and seek mercy from the Lord, because he understands the infirmities we go through. You know, so he understands all that. I mean, how great is it to have a God who does? You know, so, um, and that's, that is why we can boldly enter there. And it says that if we, uh, he, you know, he wants to comfort us. So if we, in First John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness. You know, so that's part of the compassion that the Lord has for us, to comfort us through when we sin, we can go to him. We have a mediator with the Father because Christ came down to this earth and he understands what we go through. That's why he's so forgiving toward us. Um, so the first point is that the Lord has compassion for sinners. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with these verses, Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And of course, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, so just as Christ had compassion on the lost, we should as well. Um, I'll get you to turn to Matthew 9, and we'll read from verse 35. So starting in verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So um, it's not much different today either. You know, there is a lack of soul winning and there's a lack of good preaching and just hard preaching that's going on in just about every country, but especially ours. It's, you know, other than our church, I don't know of any other church that's doing, you know, that's willing to preach the Bible without, you know, any sort of censorship, you know, that doesn't go out soul winning on a regular basis. You know, so we need to continue to pray that the Lord will raise up men in these countries to preach the gospel to the lost sheep And to not be ashamed to preach the word, you know, no matter what persecution will come from that. You know, in the book of Jude, uh, verse 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some having compassion, making a difference, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know, but Christ's compassion for sinners was not just regarding salvation. You know, so while we should pull them out of the fire and we should have compassion on them, you know, it comes in, the compassion of Christ comes in many different forms. You know, so, you know, I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 5. This is the story where he heals a man sick of the palsy. So we'll start in verse 17. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which would come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man that was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in, to lay him before him. When they could not find what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, He said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And notice it says when they saw his faith. You know, he he said, My sins, uh, my man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? I mean, that's a good question, but of course they don't understand the answer. He is God. He can forgive sins. Uh, But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. So he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. So again, we see a crossover here between the Lord saying, you know, your sins are forgiven you and, you know, being healed, get up and walk. You know, because the Lord had the power to do both. You know, but he chose to say, your sins are forgiven thee uh, because to him it was the same thing. You know, it showed his compassion to heal this man um, because this man had said it showed his faith. So this man had faith and the Lord had compassion on him to heal him. Uh, And to forgive his sins, it's because his faith was placed on the Lord. Um, which brings me to point two, how the Lord cares for the sick. So when Christ came, he performed many healing miracles, you know, partly to show that he had the power of God, that he was the Son of God, but also because he had compassion on them. So turn to Matthew chapter 8. We'll read about the centurion's servant. We'll start in verse 5. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. I mean, look at the great faith this man's showing here. You know, he just said, look, you don't even have to come. Just say the word and it's done. I mean, he understood the word of God has power. So he said, 
yeah, from a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. But we see here, you know, the unbelieving Jews, mainly the Pharisees, you know, he's saying, look, the people here that have faith, the centurion even, who's a Gentile, you know, they're going to see the kingdom of God. They're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you yourselves who think you're Jews, you're going to be cast out. You know, you're not going to see this. You're not going to partake of that. Um, so uh, verse 29 in Matthew, Matthew 20. So this is where Jesus heals two blind men. It says, And they departed from Jericho. A great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the way, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? And they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. Then they followed him. So again, the Lord just has compassion on those, especially those who are of faith, who, who believe in him. You know, because he just asked them, you know, what do you want that I can do to you? And they said, help me. Like they knew he had the power to do that. You know, they didn't doubt that at all. Um, I'll get you to turn to uh, Luke chapter 7. I'll just read to you from Mark chapter 1. It said, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. So we'll see in Luke chapter 7, he raises the widow's son from the dead. We'll start in verse 11. It said, And it came to pass the day after that he went to a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up, and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying, this, That a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And of course, we have the, uh, the story in John of Lazarus as well, who was raised from the dead. You know, there were many miracles that the Lord did. But he has a lot of compassion for the sick, you know, and especially those who are afflicted with illness, um, with devils, but also those who, you know, some of them have just lost a loved one. You know, and a lot of these were done just so they could glorify God. You know, and that's the compassion he has toward us as well. You know, so if we sin, we confess uh, our sins to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. You know, if we're in sick and we need healing, you know, these are all things we can go to the Lord with and ask Him and pray to Him, you know, because He understands our infirmities and He has compassion on us. You know, and we also don't want to be like the Pharisees who were hypocrites and they had no compassion. So I'll get you to turn to John chapter 5 and we'll read a story here where the Lord heals a man. But uh, the Pharisees, you know, they end up getting rebuked because they have no compassion. We'll start in verse 5 of John chapter 5. It says, And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had now been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, 
Well, I am coming another step of them before me. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. He took up his bed and walked. On the same day it was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then I say him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. I mean, but Jesus did nothing wrong here. You know, of course, he heals, he's allowed to heal on the Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But, you know, it's like they were angry at him, not because he healed a man, but because he was working on the Sabbath. You know, there's no compassion there. There's no love there. These people cared only for themselves. In Mark chapter 3, we see also the man with the withered hand. You know, the hearts of the Pharisees there were hardened against the man. You know, while Jesus had compassion, he restored his hand on the Sabbath. I'll get you to turn to John chapter 7. You know, but the Pharisees are hypocrites who were not innocent of breaking the Sabbath themselves. And Jesus even has to rebuke them for this in John chapter 7. So while they were all indignant about working on the Sabbath, they all break it anyway. You know, they just hated God. That's what it comes down to. So in verse 22 of John 7, it says, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive a circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? I mean, just a complete hypocrisy from them. You know, so they get angry with the, with the Lord because he chose to heal a man or cast out a devil on the Sabbath. They just have no love or compassion. But then he says, you know, those who don't have the Father, there is no love of the Father in them. You know, so we know exactly why they're like that. So um, you, you see that uh, in Luke chapter 13, this is where he casts out uh, a devil out of a woman and he has to rebuke them again. You know, the Lord then answered them and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said of these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done for him. And I said, I mean, we don't have so much of an issue with this because we're not under the Sabbath. You know, we're under the Sabbath of Christ, which Pastor Kevin has preached on before. You know, so we rest in him. Um, but, you know, just don't be ever too self-righteous to be able to help your brother. You know, just don't have that attitude that the Pharisees had to have no compassion toward people. You know, you should have that love and compassion on, on those who are in need, you know, to the stranger, but especially your brethren. So, I'll get you to turn to Deuteronomy 24. Um, but the Lord has compassion on the multitudes that followed him, and he performs the miracles of the loaves and the fishes. He performs the miracle twice. First with the feeding of 5,000 men and then the feeding of the 4,000 with seven loaves. Um, but he also has provision for the fatherless and widows. I preached this in the sermon um, when I preached on Ruth. Um, but he has provision for gleaning from the fields. You know, and pay the, it says to poor, pay the poor man. At the end of the day, do not withhold what is owed to him because he's poor and in need of food and raiment. So if you're able to pay, you know, you should, if you owe someone money, you should be paying that back. You know, if that person's poor and they're in need, then you don't withhold that from them. You make sure they have enough to eat, enough to live on. Um, and First Timothy 5 has good instructions on that as well, on provision for the widows. Um, but I did cover a lot of that before. But we'll just read from Deuteronomy 24, verse 12. It says, And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, 
that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. So a pledge is basically collateral. It's like when you, if you borrow money, you give him something as collateral. But if he needs his coat to sleep, then you've got to give it back to him at the end of the day because he needs to sleep. Um, it says, Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor or needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. And thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. So again, we see that if you're withholding wages from employees, you know, because you just don't want to pay them and they're poor and they need that money to eat, you know, they need it for the heating, whatever, you know, you've got to pay them. That's sin before the Lord. Because if they cry unto the Lord, you're the one who's going to get punished for that. You know, and you absolutely should be. It's wicked. It says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgotten a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God might bless thee in all the work of thine hands. So again, it's about not withholding from those who are in need. So we see something similar in Leviticus 19 as well, but I covered that in the last sermon. But these are the provisions that the Lord has instituted for the poor, the fatherless and the widows. You know, and it shows his compassion towards those, especially those who are in affliction, whether they be poor or widows, you know, or just need healing or, you know, just whatever state they're in. Um, and these are the many times uh, that he showed compassion to the people in Israel. I'll just read these through for you, uh, but I'll get you to turn to Micah chapter 7. And I'll just read some of these for you, um, where the Lord had compassion on Israel. In 2 Chronicles 30 verse 9, it says, For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you, if you return to him. In 2 Chronicles 36 verse 15, it says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent them by his messengers, rising up the times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Psalm 70, 78 verse 37, For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. Psalm 86 verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 111, verse 4. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 112, verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. And Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. So we see, even especially in David, you know, he's writing the Psalms, there are plenty of times where he just said, look, the Lord is full of compassion. He's gracious. He's merciful. You know, that's the God we serve. You know, he has that same compassion and mercy toward us. So Micah wrote this in chapter 7. He's speaking of the coming, the coming Messiah, which we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and it's a great description of the Lord and the many great attributes he has. You know, namely, compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. So starting in verse 18, Micah 7, 18, it says, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob, and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. You know, so these are all the things that Christ has for us, if you believe on him. You know, you'll have mercy, you'll have compassion. It says he will cast your sins into the depths of the sea. 
you know, and remember them no more. You know, and this is what he came to do when he died on the cross. You know, this is what he did for us. You know, and it's what he did for them also, but it didn't profit them because they didn't believe. So in Romans chapter 9, verse 14, a lot of people will know this passage. But it says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he'll have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So the Lord has mercy on those and compassion on those who he chooses, and he'll harden those who he chooses to harden. You know, so reprobates, their hearts are hardened by God. You know, but God chooses to show compassion on others. You know, so that's a, it brings up the example of Pharaoh, because Pharaoh was a reprobate. God hardened his heart to show an example to the people of Egypt and to the whole world that I'm God and I'm going to deliver you out of this. You know, so that God got all the glory from that. You know, and we see uh, he took the kingdom away from Saul, but he swore he'd never take it away from David. You know, so while he had compassion on David, he didn't have that same compassion on Saul because God chooses who he wants to have compassion on and he chose his lineage was going to come through David. You know, so it leaves the question of how do we apply that to us? You know, so I find that pretty simple actually. You know, we show the same compassion for others that Christ showed to us. You know, so we, we can't forgive sins and we can't just heal the sick. You know, we can't cast out devils, but we can show, show our love to the lost through soul winning. We can show compassion on the sick by praying for their infirmities. You know, so it brings us to the, the next and final point, which is a commandment of showing love to the brethren. So there's great examples of this. Um, David, first of all, probably had more love for his enemies than anyone. You know, he was able to, even when Saul was out to kill him, he still loved Saul and he still would not raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. Um, I'll get you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9 and we're going to read about David's kindness though to the last of the household of Saul. So in verse 1 of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, Then David said, Is there yet any left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. When they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Now it does explain somewhere else that he was lame on his feet, because when, they, uh, when the nurse heard that Saul uh, had, had lost his kingdom, had been killed, um, that she fled with the young child in her arms and ended up tripping and causing him to be lame. Um, so this is why he's unable to walk. Um, in verse 4, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Emil in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is it, thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of my king's sons. 
And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So again, even though Saul was the enemy of David for many, many years, he sought to kill him for many years, you know, he still had kindness on his, his best friend Jonathan, on his son, who was a descendant of Saul. You know, so again, we can show compassion on our enemies as we're commanded to do. You know, if, someone, if David can do it, you know, why can't we? Um, we see uh, another example of compassion was Moses when he stood in the gap many times for the people of Israel. And one great time he did that was in Exodus chapter 32. You know, where, uh, I'll just read from 32, 31. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. This is just after they've made this golden calf. Just, just after they've got the Ten Commandments. Um... So have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. So this, this is him asking, he knows about the book of life, about those who go to heaven or hell. If your name's not written in the book of life, you cast into the lake of fire. And he's saying, you know, he loves his people so much. You know, and despite the way they treated him, he was not treated well by those people. But he still had compassion on them. You know, you would say they probably were his enemies. You know, even though he didn't consider them that. They would have been enemies of Moses. They certainly murmured and complained against him more than anybody. But he still had a lot of compassion for those people, so much that he even said, look, I'll, I'll go to hell just so these people can be forgiven. I mean, who can do that? Honestly, who's got that kind of compassion? You know, and this is why the Lord considered him you know, the meekest man upon the earth. You know, he esteemed everybody above himself, even those that hated him. You know, but the instruction the Lord left us is very clear. Um, I'll get you to turn to First John chapter four. In First John chapter four, verse seven, it says, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth not God, for God is." He that loveth not knoweth God, for God is love. And that's why we see that in the Pharisees. They didn't know God and they had no love in their hearts. It says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So again, to love one another is to have compassion and mercy on your brethren. Now, Romans 5, you know, speaks about how scarcely for a righteous man, you know, would you die. But, I mean, Christ died for sinners. He died for us when we weren't righteous. He died for us when we were sinners. You know, he didn't just die for the just. He died for the just and the unjust. You know, he died for everybody. You know, so while you might lay down your life for someone who you think is a good man, you should also be willing to lay down your life for someone who may be your enemy. You know, just to show that love and compassion that the Lord showed toward us. Um, husbands should also be willing to lay down their lives for their wives, you know, just as Christ did for the church. In Ephesians 5.22 it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that it may be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife, loveth himself. So again, you should love your wife more than your own body. You know, you should have that much love for your wife, and the wife should have that much love for her husband. You know, they should be willing because they're one flesh. You know, there should be that love there. They're willing to die for each other. We see it again in John chapter 15. It says, "As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. 
continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy may, may remain in you, and that you joy, your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. You know, and in Matthew 20, it says, you know, he gave his life a ransom for many. You know, and he gave his life a ransom for us, for his brethren. You know, can you say that you would do the same for your brethren? You know, would you lay down your life? Like, that's the greatest sign of love and friendship you can show to somebody. Because you, you do, you esteem them and you love them more than yourself. That's what that shows, you know, that Christ esteemed all of us better than himself. That he came a servant to minister to us. You know, I mean... <laughs> Who else would do that? Um, I'll just read from Matthew 18 as well, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, verse 21, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. And Jesus saith unto him, I said not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants, when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told the, the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after they called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have, com have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every brother his trespass. So again, it's about, you know, if you have a problem with your brother, first you should go straight to your brother and try and figure it out. But I mean, if your brother owes you something, you know, like if... Christ has forgiven us of so much, you know, so if, if you have an argument with somebody and, you, you know, you just need to forgive, if they come to you and say, look, I repent, sorry, you know, you've got to forgive them. It says 70 times 7. You know, don't hold a grudge against your brother, you know, because you've been forgiven of much more than what he's done to, done to you. I mean, I won't go into it as well, but uh, you see the Good Samaritan, you'd be all familiar with the story, you know, but a good neighbour will show mercy and compassion. You know, they're the attributes you will have if you walk in the Spirit. So I'll get you to turn to First Peter chapter 3. So now we're going to get into how do we show compassion and do good works. So in verse 8 of First Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, First Peter 3, it says, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and the ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So we see James also, it's another great book on doing good works. But this is speaking about how you deal, like your conversation with your brethren, how you speak to them, how you deal with them. You know, so when you have an argument, you know, try not to return railing for railing, you know, but try to rather bless them and try and, you know, diffuse a situation rather than just making it worse. And fighting with your brethren. In James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Let 
Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the, into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seems to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and his Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we see again in, in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This is like when it speaks in, in, in chapter 2, that faith without works is dead. You know, so you need to have good religion. You need to have, have work out your faith with your love for the brethren, with the way you speak to them, the way you deal with them, you know, and not have a vain religion, you know, not have dead faith. You know. uh, and you do see that in, in uh, James chapter 2. We won't go into it, but it, it speaks about how if your neighbour comes to your door and asks for food you know, and you turn them away, then that's a wicked thing to do. You, know, you work out your faith by showing love and compassion Providing for your brethren if they need it. If they're poor, help them out, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, just read the end of Titus. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life, a faithful saying, and these things will I that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, not just profitable for yourself, but also to profit your brethren. You know, you need to also be somebody who's a minister to your brethren and to help them be profited by what you do. And we show that love through good works. You know, and the Lord laid down his life for us and we are to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, and that's the love of the Father. It says if you deny your brother, how is the, the compassion and the love of the Father in you? You know, so we need to constantly check ourselves to check our hearts if it's toward the brethren, if we have that love and compassion for God's children. So I'll read from 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. So 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is a message that was heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we are passed from death into life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to wait, lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So again, words are cheap. You know, you can say, I love the brethren. You can say all kinds of things. It's like when people claim the name of Christ. You know, it's like they can say that, but do they actually believe it? Do you actually work out your love? You know, or do you just say it? You know, is it just empty words? It says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. So the best way we can show we love God 
is that we have the love of the Father in us and have compassion on those to do good works to our brethren, to show the love that God has for us to our brethren. That shows that we love God. You know, and then God says God sees that and He rewards us because those things are pleasing in His sight. So uh, James chapter 5, starting in verse 10, it just says, Take my brethren the prophets which are spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven nor by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So again, you know, if someone's hungry or in want and you're able to meet those needs, then it's your responsibility, if you want to show love to the Father, to meet those needs. You know, if he's fallen, then pick him up. If he's sick, then pray for him. You know, if he's lost and backslidden, then go find him and bring him back. You know, the Lord's love knows no bounds. And we should feel the same about the brethren. You know, so check your heart whether it be towards his people. So in Matthew 5.42, it says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. In Psalm 112, verse 5, it says, A good man showeth favour, and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, it says, If there be any among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God hath giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut up thy hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. So again, you know, if you see someone who can't afford to pay the rent or can't afford to eat or, you know, whatever, then you should help your brethren out, you know. Because the Lord says you shouldn't harden your heart to that person, but rather show compassion. And conversely as well, you know, if you're going to borrow money, then don't misuse that money. You know, like your brother's done a good thing by lending to you. You know, so you don't want to do something wicked by, uh, you know, misusing what he and the Lord have given you. Proverbs 19.17, it says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given, he will pay him again. You know, so it doesn't just apply to the brethren either. You know, what's, a lot of what I preach today, while it is geared towards the brethren, it can also apply to your enemies, you know, or just those who were lost and not your brethren. So I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 27 of Luke chapter 6. It says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. As you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them that do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So again, we see about here lending even to the wicked, to your enemies, to, to people who ask, you know. Just give and don't expect to receive it again, you know. Just give it out of love. Uh, but I will say this, you know, it does also say if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. 
So I'm not talking about just giving money to the homeless, giving money to people who are too lazy to work. You know, if they're able-bodied and they, do, they can work, but they just don't want to work, then don't give them any money. You know, this is not what he's teaching. You know, our duty is to those who are first of our brethren, but also to those who are poor and maimed. You know, and the poor doesn't include the lazy. This is just people who just can't make ends meet. You know, they, they might have a job, might even have two jobs, and they still just can't make ends meet. Just, you know, that might be the time where you can help someone out. You know, if they come to you, don't close up your bowels of mercy and refuse them. So, you know, and the Bible does command that if you're in a position to do so, which is the Lord's blessing, you should lend it unto others. But conversely as well, if you borrow, you must repay your debts. So Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. So again, if you borrow and have no intention of paying it back, you know, or you don't re repay your debt and you're able to, then you're a wicked person. You know, like if they're unable to repay and, you know, you know you're not going to get the money back, then it's better to forgive the debt than to hate your brother. Um, but you have that choice whether to show mercy or not. Um, but it doesn't give the borrower license to just take money and then never repay it because it says you're an absolutely wicked person if you do that. You know, taking advantage of your brother, <laughs> you know, that's not compassion either. You know, you're going to be punished for that. Um, you know, and it's some, if someone helps you, maybe they, you know, they put your name out there or something like that as well. You know, in, sort of especially in a professional manner, whether it be for a job or, you know, you're going to rent a house or something like that. Like, behave in a manner that would be honourable to your brother. You know, you don't want to bring shame to them and make them look bad in front of other people. You know, that should be something that you do as well. So if you don't have that love or compassion, pray and ask God because he will give it to you. But most importantly, if you walk in the Spirit, it'll cause you to have that love and compassion because it is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So we'll finish up on Ephesians chapter 4. So uh, on verse 1. So Ephesians 4 verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We'll move down to verse 20. It says, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may be able to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So... I'll read from uh, 1 Corinthians 30. You don't have to turn there. You can if you like. Um, but if you forsake the assembly and you don't attend a local church, then how can you possibly work out your faith and how can you possibly show love to the brethren? You know, Because it's the people here, these are our brethren. We're all brethren here. So if you're not part of a local church, you're missing out on a big part of that, You know, in both being blessed by your brethren and being able to be a blessing to them. And that is an important commandment that the Lord gives us to not forsake the assembly. But I also thought it was interesting, it's no coincidence that one of the synonyms of compassion is charity. You know, that's one of the ways you work out compassion. Um, let's see. So I have Colossians 3, 
verse 12 to 14, it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So we get to 1 Corinthians 13. Just the last verse of that, I highly suggest you read through 1 Corinthians 13 because it's, it's a chapter on charity, on how to work that out. But at the end it says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So of all the things you can do after believing on the Lord to be saved, charity, compassion, pity and love for your brethren and for the lost, that's the greatest work that you can do. So let's pray.